and sing
of Philippians says that God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and that his name is above every other name, that at, at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It's incredible to think that there's power and authority behind a name. But he tells us this, that, and we even pray, when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. We back it up with the trust and faith that God is the one who hears us and actually answers our prayers, that he's involved and active, that he has power and authority over this world and over our lives. And so this song is just a declaration of that authority in the name of Jesus, that we trust in his power, that we trust that his name is above every other name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Bye. 
Except for my heart singing hallelujah.
take a seat. Would you greet somebody nearby? Say hello for a moment. We'll continue shortly. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's really windy outside. That's like scary for Huntington Beach residents. I'm glad you're all here. Glad you guys could join us this morning. Welcome. My name is Brian. I'm the worship pastor here at Branches. It's just a joy to worship with you. Um, We're glad that you could join us. It's going to be a great morning. I want to just take a moment and pray for our giving. If you give... Um, thank you for worshiping in that way. It's just—it's a way that we, um, you know, put our trust in the Lord. It's a way that we say that the Lord comes first in our lives. And so, um, you know, on, every Sunday we pass a basket around. Many of us don't even give with paper money. I bought a coffee with paper money the other day, and the, the barista looked at me like, what is this document you're handing me? Um, I said, it's money. It's valuable. You can take it. But all joking aside... I know that several of us, you know, we give online and we just hand this basket over. But I, I love that we still pass something around because it's a tangible object that we put in our hands and we can continue to pray and have something that reminds us of the Lord's goodness, remind us to pray and to put the Lord first in our lives. And so um, I just want to invite you to do that, even if you kind of have that habit of just moving it along. There's still value in just having it in your hand and letting it be that reminder to you um, this morning. I'm going to pray, we're going to have a time of offering, and then we're going to have some announcements for you. Thank you, Lord, that you're good to us. We've already entered in with worship and prayer, Lord, so I pray that you've already begun the work in our hearts this morning. And we come before you to sacrifice, to surrender, to let go, to put you first in our lives in more ways than just one, Lord. So we put you first with our possessions. We put you first in our hearts. We put you first with our time, Lord. Let that commitment be something we can follow through on this week as the people of God. And would you use us to make a difference in your kingdom in this world, Lord? We love you. We thank you for your goodness. And we give it back to you in praise. In Jesus' name, amen. As we give, would you turn your eyes to the screen? Lisa, the missions and women's pastor here, and I've got a few things to invite you into this next month. 
Each first Sunday of the month, we collect food along with other churches for the Oakview community. The food bank is struggling to provide enough food for families, so we ask you to consider bringing an item or two next Sunday so we can help build the food supply. As we feed our own church family at Potluck next Sunday, we also want to feed our community to serve and be served. You can find a list of needed items at the connection table or on our website. In collaboration with Likewise Worship, our Branches Worship team released a new single called Behold. This is the first release of many in the upcoming months, so follow and save our songs on Spotify and Apple Music or wherever else you stream. Just look up Branches Worship and you can find our songs. Our mission partner Young Lives walks alongside teen moms and dads here in North OC. They're hosting their annual Giving Gala on Saturday, November 4th at 6 p.m. over at Rock Harbor Church in Costa Mesa. From generation to generation, Young Lives is seeing the amazing impact of community, fellowship, and love. And for over a decade, they've been sharing Jesus, mentoring, encouraging, serving, and investing in the multiple generations of teen moms, dads, their children, and their extended families. At the gala, they'll have a 24 carats catered dinner, silent auction, storytelling, dream sharing, and many special guests. Purchase tickets to support this incredible ministry at brancheshb.com or at the connection table after service. Over the years, it's been incredible for me to have a front row seat to the ways in which God calls people in our branches family to serve others with the heart of Jesus, raising up mission partners from our very own community. I'm going to pass it off to Andrew to introduce to you our newest mission partner, James Yoon. Hey everyone, I'm here with James Yoon a participant in our branches community. In fact, he's been a participant in our branches community since our inception, since before our inception, actually. Uh, James has been involved as a community group leader. He was a part of our prayer team. He actually served for a long time as our chairman of the board at branches. And in fact, when I stepped into my role as the campus pastor of Rock Harbor, James was the first meeting I had with somebody from the congregation. So we go way back. We're good friends, and I've seen James's story develop and his sense of calling develop around this ministry opportunity that he's gonna be stepping into over the course of this next year. He's going to be working with Wycliffe Bible Translators as a translation consultant. That means that he's gonna be going alongside a team of people around the world to people groups who do not have the Bible in their written language, and maybe in fact don't even have a written form of their language. So this team goes out, helps them actually create a written language around the way that they're speaking, and then makes a translation of the Bible that they can have as a resource in their own communities. Uh, James at this point does not know where he's going, but through his particular role, he's gonna be helping people who are on the ground by being a resource in terms of original languages, in terms of theology, he's going to be using his ministry expertise and degrees and the ways that he's been equipped to help get Bibles in the hands of people who do not have them around the world. Now, this is a really exciting and unique calling. How did this develop in your life, James? Well, I, when I be, uh, came to salvation, I really loved the Bible. I read it till my eyes were blurry. And then I went on a mission trip in college and visited a friend from that trip. And his brother talked to me while I was there, and it turns out he was being trained by Wycliffe. So he told me about Wycliffe, told me about Bible translation, and I got really excited because it, it was something that I could do with my life that centered around the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know there were people out there that that didn't have a Bible they could, they could read for themselves. Mm -hmm. And changed my major, uh, went to seminary, and was all ready to go. So that's years ago though. I mean, how many years ago did you finish your seminary degree? I finished in 2004. 2004, so we're talking a sense of calling that developed, you know, near two decades ago. Yes. So obviously there were some things that got in the way of you just jumping out into the mission field. Thankfully for us, because you've been part of our community, which I appreciate very much, but 
What's changed that now you're finally stepping into this sense of calling that you had almost 20 years ago? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the main reasons I stuck around was because um, all my family members had some medical issues from time to time. Seminary is pretty expensive, so I had a lot of school debt. Mm -hmm. So, but last January, I got an email from my loan service provider and they said, my loans are forgiven. So, praise God for that. And, uh, you know, by this time, my, my family uh, issues had kind of settled down and, um, and the straw that, uh, you know, broke the camel's back, uh, so to speak, um, was that I got noticed I was being laid off from my, my job. Okay, so something that could have been bad news has turned into good news yes. and is going to turn into this massive ministry opportunity. And as long as I've known you, you've talked about this sense of calling and this opportunity that's been on your heart. You didn't know how you were going to get there. And actually through something unfortunate for most people, the most exciting new chapter of your life is opening up. Yeah, absolutely. I, After about a week of sitting in that news, I realized I was actually pretty free. Uh, you know, nothing holding me back anymore. So I emailed Wycliffe, they got back to me. I had a couple interviews. They invited me on a vision trip and filled out my application and became a missionary with them as of June 1st. So, I mean, just on a personal level, this is so exciting for me. Uh, one of my favorite photos from our entire history is a photo of James coming up out of the water when he was baptized at one of our services. Uh, 10 years ago. And and I remember him talking about this at that first meal that I enjoyed with you. So uh, just to see this brother who served alongside us feeling the prompting of the Holy Spirit and we get to be a support. I mean, th this is how our story of Branches has gone, that the Holy Spirit has laid calling and vision upon the lives of people in our congregation. And we've been able to come alongside them to see all these ministry partners grow and expand locally and around the world. And now we have a new ministry partner that cares about something core to us, which is the word of God. I mean, you know, that's true at the Branches community, that everything we do is based out of God's truth. And, and I know you presented this. What would our lives be like if we never had the Bible, if we never had God's truth to depend on? And there's so many people groups around the world who don't have it. And yet you're going to be a part of reaching those people groups and resourcing them with what God has said and what God has spoken and with the living word. So we're behind you as a whole. We need to be with James in this. What can we do? How can the average person, how can we as a community support you? Yeah, so uh, what I need right now is a team of people around me to pray for me. So, uh, you know, as you know, I'm a new missionary and, um, you know, there's a lot of spiritual warfare out there and uh you know just for all the logistics and all that but uh, i also need uh, a team of financial partners as well you know i can't do this without money unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> but when you give to Wycliffe on my behalf uh, those funds just go towards helping me stay out on the field and to complete this work that god's called me to so if we want to financially support you and pray for you obviously you're going to be present in the branches community but uh, particularly this Sunday, we'll make sure James is available so that you can meet him, so you can encourage him, so you can even pray with him today and find out more about financially supporting him. Thank you so much, James. And we're looking forward to how this story develops because this isn't the last we're gonna see you or talk about this. You can learn more about James's ministry at the connection table after service. Now, please join me in welcoming up Austin Akers as he continues our series in Ecclesiastes. Good morning, church. Happy to be with you. My name is Austin. I am the youth and young adults pastor here at Branches, and it's a joy to be with you this morning, bringing God's word. As many of you know already, I am a dad. I talk about my son kind of a lot. Um, my son, Rumi, is convinced that he can fly. Whenever I'm holding him on a table, on a couch, or a chair, he tries to dive off. Not jump off, but like head first dive. And what does he think is going to happen? He's going to fly, obviously. It's obviously what's going to happen. And I've shown him no Marvel, no comic books, no manga, I don't believe he's listened to Learn to Fly by the Foo Fighters, yet he is convinced that he will fly. 
But something he has experienced is being held by his parents at a much greater height than what he can attain on his own. I'll hold him over my head and whoosh him around, calling him Subaru, not to get confused with the car brand Subaru. And though he is a baby, he can reveal something on a level that we can all relate to. We desire greatness, we desire experiences, we have an innate desire to soar in life. But on our own, we're on our way to a crash. On our own, we're not able, capable of fulfilling these God-given desires. We're not capable on our own. For we need to be lifted up by our Heavenly Father, He who carries us. And you see, we may try to succeed in life, we may try to gain the whole world, yet it remains unfulfilling, which is odd. You would imagine that if you got all that you wanted, you would finally be happy. But then you eventually come to the same conclusion that the teacher from Ecclesiastes reaches. Everything is meaningless, which sounds depressing, but it's not necessarily how it sounds. It's not meaningless in the sense that it is without meaning. Rather, it's meaningless in the sense that the meaning isn't quite clear. You see, the word that we're going to be reading, meaningless, the word in Hebrew is hevel, which means breath or vapor or smoke. It appears for a moment and then vanishes. It's something we cannot grasp. It's like the wind coming and going. I didn't realize how hard that would hit today. It is like the wind That is like ruining everything today. Um, So what do we do with this? What do we do with this meaninglessness of life? Let's go to the words of the teacher, seeing it for both what he's saying as well as through the lens of he who can give it meaning, our heavenly father who carries us. Let's open to God's word. This is going to be out of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. The words will be up on the screen. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. This is God's word for us this morning. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. What does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers, a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless at chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can a king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fools walk in darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of a fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless, for the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten, like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For people may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to others who have not toiled for it. 
this too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and all the anxious striving which with they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. People can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat? Who can find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to the hand, to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Let's pray. Lord, we know you're good. We've seen your goodness in our lives. We've also had times of confusion, times when things aren't quite clear, what we ought to do, how we ought to act and react. So I pray for clarity in this time. Holy Spirit, may you bring things to mind that we can work through as we go through your text and may we walk away changed. As we encounter you, Lord, as we have communion with you, Lord, may you be working on our hearts and minds. May we be open and available for your transformative power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So before breaking down the text, I want to clear the air. We don't go to the Bible to necessarily find inspiration from every biblical character. We go to the Bible to discover the heart of God. The heart of God and God's work through the brokenness, God's work through broken people. Solomon is not necessarily a character to look up to. It's not why he's in the Bible. Rather, he's another broken person that God can speak through, that God can be revealed through his brokenness. God's light shining through his brokenness. I don't want anybody here who may be new to the faith to read this chapter and be like, is this guy biblical? Is his lifestyle biblical? Like, yes, it's in the Bible, but the person Solomon is in our inspiration, Jesus is. And going through the text, what the teacher is doing here, he's revealing the lies of this world, the lie that we can be satisfied with what is found under the sun. And he does end the chapter with some hope, but truly he breaks down the lies that maybe even some of us today may subscribe to. And you see, the breaking down of lies, it's incredibly important for both ourselves as well as for our witness to others. If you you live your life believing lies, you're not going to be living in reality at all. You're going to be living in a pseudo-reality that always leaves you surprised that things aren't going how they should be. And Dostoevsky's novel, Brothers Karamazov, Father Zosima says this, Above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him, and so loses all respect for himself and for others. And having no respect, he ceases to love. So in light of that, we mustn't lie to ourselves about our current reality. The pursuit of satisfaction outside of life with God is faulty. It's like a chasing after the wind. And the teacher, he was honest with himself. He had everything, yet it felt like he had nothing. It's all a vapor where the meaning is not quite clear. And by not subscribing to the lies of worldly satisfaction, we're finally able to love others. When we instead draw from the love of God, we are most fit to love others genuinely and fully. In today's scripture reading, this will be a case study by the teacher on the various aspects of life that we all experience. The pursuit of pleasure, the dichotomy of wisdom and folly, and work. All of these things shared without the perspective of closeness to God. Solomon, he's talking about these things absent of God's presence. We see Solomon, he's running from the voice of God, chasing after many worldly ambitions. And so, the teacher declares this is meaningless. Again, not without meaning, but in which the meaning isn't quite clear. Beginning with the uh, pursuit of pleasure, pleasure being meaningless. The text begins, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. You see, Solomon, he tested the theory of getting satisfaction from all that you've ever dreamed of, 
and it was false. And many people will hear this and think, well, duh, yeah, we know this. We grew up in church, we know this, but we still hold on to things with such high regard that we think that once we finally get them, then we'll be set. Let's do a thought experiment for a moment. Take a moment to think, if I just had this, then I'd be content. If I just had this, then I'd be happy. If I just had this, then I'd be enough. Was anybody able to think of something? You see, this is a common misconception that we may all fall into. We, like myself included, all of us, but fortunately we don't have the same luxury as Solomon. He had endless resources, so he was able to draw that ultimate result. And what was it? The teacher declares, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired, refused my heart no pleasure, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Imagine that. That feeling would be pretty sobering, achieving the highest level only to realize you were playing the wrong game. It's not it at all. Actor Jim Carrey shares the same thoughts. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Pleasure makes for a very poor God. And if it's not all about pleasure, then what could life be all about? Let's now tackle Solomon's take on pursuing wisdom. Verse 12, then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what's already been done? That imagery is interesting, of the king's successor. What more can be done than what's already been done? We'll just be doing things all over again. Or worse, having done a poor job, not living up to the king. Which actually happens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam. He ultimately rejected God and led people to the same end, calling them to worship other gods. So be it the king's successor or just a, another average person, what more can be done than what's already been done? People operate with wisdom, people operate with folly, but to what end? But what is true that we see in verse 13 is wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fools walk in darkness. This is valid. It is good to walk with wisdom. I experienced the other side of it last night. Last night, I went to Chick-fil-A. Praise God. I was on my way to a concert. We had to get some food. And I walk up to the, the cashier, checker, server. I'm not really sure what they're called at Chick-fil-A, but I see there's a new item on the menu. It is the honey pepper pimento. And I'm like, this looks insane. What is this? And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, don't you work here? <laughs> like, what's a pimento? And she's like, I don't know. Kind of looks like tuna salad. I was like, you're grossing me out. And she's like, but have you had our macaroni and cheese? I was like, all right, I guess we're going elsewhere. We're moving on from the honey pepper pimento. I was like, I have. She's like, have you put it on the sandwich? I'm like, I'm listening. She's like, all right, get a side of mac and cheese. You put it on the sandwich. Have you had our bacon? I was like, slow down. She's like, sorry. I was like, no, 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 praise God. But like, I'm not going to add too much. And so I, I take her advice. I get the chicken sandwich and I add the macaroni and cheese. It was delicious, and I felt horrible. I felt horrible afterwards. I felt like a fool walking in the darkness. So even with wisdom appearing meaningless, it's still better to be wise. It's still better to make good decisions. The wise walk with eyes in their heads, which is another way to say those who choose folly choose to walk blindly. They lack clarity, like myself. I forgot I was 29 and I can't eat like a 17-year-old anymore. This just, it doesn't work for me anymore. And though the meaning isn't clear, Solomon chose wisdom. He chose wisdom for it gives clarity rather than just living with madness and folly. So he's not saying to live rambunctious, even if he is questioning what is worth it to even live with wisdom. But alas, the fate of the wise is the same as the fate of the fool. Verse 16 for the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. Like the fool, the wise too must die. Wisdom also makes for a very poor God. Next, the teacher tackles the pursuit of hard work. Verse 18, 
I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And this verse can be found in the inspiring verses to read while writing your will section of the Bible app. Totally kidding. But it does give good perspective. Remember the thought experiment that I did earlier when I asked you of your greatest desire that you have, that which can maybe finally give you contentment. I've always wondered if there'll be a day where I just like hit the stand off. I almost did. I don't know what, how I'd recover from that. Probably making fun of myself as I do all the time. That thought experiment where I asked you to think of the greatest desire, that which would finally give you contentment. Maybe it's buying a home, getting a new car, latest technology, top of the line gear. You're looking at that $250 pickleball paddle, whatever it is. Then what? Once you get it, then it's on to the next thing, and then the next thing, and the next thing, taking up space in your brain, constantly dwelling on what if, and then you die. And sure, maybe you're setting up your kids for a good future, but if you're dying on the inside while you're still living and projecting pain onto your kids, will it be worth it? What was meant to be a blessing will instead be a curse. Yes, the inheritance will be great, but... How was the relationship? See, the reality of a life that is consumed with work is expressed in verse 23. All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This, too, is meaningless. Be it dwelling on work late at night or even utilizing your smartphone and allowing yourself to work late into the night. Even at night, our minds do not rest. As I've shared in this setting before, poet Mary Oliver once said, attention is the beginning of devotion, meaning what we give our attention to the most is going to be what we are most devoted to and what will end up shaping us the most. So if we give all of our attention to our work and that which we gain from it, it'll be a devotion that leaves us empty. It's a chasing after the wind. It's all meaningless where the meaning isn't quite clear. Work, too, makes for a very poor God. So how are we feeling, church? Nothing like a nice, uplifting message on a Sunday morning. I did say there'd be good news at the end about our Heavenly Father who carries us, but I didn't want to hold back on the reality of life. That wouldn't be helpful for you guys if I shied away from the reality of worthless pursuits. Much of life is meaningless, where the meaning isn't quite clear a life devoid of God, it will not satisfy. But I wanted to make that apparent contrast clear. Just as on a hot day, the shade is all the more pleasant. On a cold morning, a blanket is all the more comfortable. And as darkness increases, light becomes all the more powerful. We live in a dark world, and it is Jesus who brings the light, lighting up the places that are dark, giving us clarity, direction, and life. Verse 24, a person could do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. And now this almost sounds like making a bad situation better. All is meaningless, all is vanity, so there's nothing you can do but the stuff you've already been doing and find satisfaction in it, for this is from the hand of God, which is true. We should enjoy life. Don't be angsty all the time. We should find goodness in that which we do, but it's really the next verse that is crucial for the satisfaction piece. Verse 25, for without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? For without him. It is by God that we are able to look at life through a redemptive lens. It's more than making a bad situation better. It's about seeing a bad situation redeemed. And isn't that what our God does? He redeems. He brings meaning, value, substance, hope. Finally, we get hope finally in God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Truly, everything is hollow until one finds wholeness in God. Even the greatest endeavors prove to be meaningless. You accomplish the world for what? 
But when one finds wholeness in God, they are able to see life redeemed. No longer seeking fulfillment in what was never intended to satisfy us, we were meant to be satisfied in God alone. So it's not that pleasure and wisdom and work are bad, but if we place them as the ultimate aim rather than God, they will be misplaced hope. But when they are surrendered to God, they can be enjoyed for what they are rather than burdensome for what they are not. It's similar to a phenomenon that happens often in the Acres household. I am the primary dishwasher, and as I do dishes, I do a variety of things. I'll watch YouTube, I'll listen to podcasts, sometimes I'll even mess around and put my Kindle on the windowsill. Maybe I want to get ahead in my book, so I'll like dry my hand like literally for every page. Got to do what you got to do when you're reading. But with that, it makes me pretty distracted, and I end up being a little bit of a silly goose when I get distracted. You see... So much so that I will put leftovers in a Tupperware, and instead of putting it in the fridge, I will put it in the cabinet. Exhibit A, Curtis, if you could put up the photo. Kara sent me this photo. She said, what the heck are the pancakes doing in the cabinet? The pancakes in the cabinet are going to go bad, Austin. Putting them in the fridge, that would preserve them. And so it goes with placing our hope rightly having our hope in God, and then committing our pleasure, our wisdom, our work to God. And in doing so, God will preserve them like a fridge. God will give purpose to them rather than leaving them to rot like leftover pancakes in a cabinet. So pleasure, wisdom, and work, they are not bad things, but they will go bad if they're not rightly placed in the Lord. So it's not what we do in life, but to whom we do it for that will bring us satisfaction, that will bring us meaning. Take Brother Lawrence, for example, a fellow dishwasher. Shout out one time for my dishwashers. He worked in a monastery, and people would watch him wash dishes because he did it with so much joy. Imagine that, a crowd of people watching someone washing dishes, and why? Because he was practicing the presence of God, so his book is titled. He was in constant communication with God, and because that, he was overflowing with joy, so much so that people would watch him wash dishes. And with that, he found meaning in dishwashing because of what went beyond it, not the thing itself, it being communion with God. Another example, I went to a concert last night after Chick-fil-A. I was dying the whole time because of my mistake that I made. And I saw my favorite Christian rapper, KB. K to the second letter, not a second better. He had a moment when he was talking about the glory of God and how he wants to do all things for it, not for his own glory. And he said this last night. People often ask me if I get jealous of worldly artists that are much bigger than me. But I say no, because I get to do work for the one who makes my work eternal, who makes it go beyond me. How good is that? That's why he's my favorite Christian rapper. He says stuff like that. So good. You see, when we commit our lives to Jesus, we are committing our lives to what goes beyond our lives. We are investing in the eternal, not chasing after the wind. And that's what we're called to, church. Not finding meaning in what we do or who we are, but in what's been done for us and whose we are. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus and are declared children of God as a result. Perhaps you've heard the expression, God-shaped hole in your heart. I just explained this to the youth this past Wednesday. It's this God-shaped hole that we may try to fill with our jobs, financial security, relationship, and so forth. You see, these are all good things. Don't get me wrong. These are all good things, but they don't make good gods. God alone can fill us, as that was his intent with creating us. We were created to be wholly and completely satisfied in him. But with that said, how do we view pleasure and wisdom and work through a redemptive lens? Let's read James chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. The words will be on the screen. James writes this. Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, 
spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? I don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now, using similar verbiage to Solomon, James is saying we are a mist that appears for a moment and then vanishes. While Solomon's saying everything is a mist, everything is a vapor. So we're in the same category, temporary and fleeting. What do we do with that? What do we do with the brevity of life, our short time here? We must live in obedience to God with all that we do. As seen in verse 15, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. It's doing all things with God and for God. This is how we will find true satisfaction and live the most full life. And not only that, this is how we will end well. For when we move on, after our last breath, all of us are going to have to give an account to the Lord of what we did with our lives. God bless you. Not, much, not how much did you give to charity, not how into philanthropy you were like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, or even Mr. Beast. It's not about how much you gave, but did you give your heart to Jesus? Did you receive salvation from him and have his grace realized in your life by the way you lived, by the way you responded to the cross? You see, people who live for the world, they may feel how they ought to act good, be charitable, kind, and gracious, but to what aim? What do they measure their goodness up to? How could they possibly know if they're good enough? But with God, with the word, we have confidence in how we ought to live, how we ought to go about living our lives with the pursuit of pleasure and wisdom and work and how we are already are good enough because Jesus was good for us. You see, doing good, it can be frustrating for people who live with the world But Jesus, he gives purpose beyond this life. And because of that, he gives us purpose through this life. Because we have purpose beyond this life, we are are able to have purpose through this life. And that is only by Jesus. Clearly, Solomon had every advantage in life. He had everything. But the truth is, though he had every advantage in life, he had no advantage in death. The same fate awaits us all. So where do we land with this? Is all meaningless, Austin? Yes, in the sense that the meaning is not often clear as to why things are the way they are, but then there's God, he who brings meaning, he who gives proper perspective. Similar to my experience with Rumi. There's gonna be one more Rumi story, guys. I'm sorry. He is my baby, and he is learning how to be a human. And that requires tumbling over often, pulling up on literally everything. His judgment is not very good. The least stable things he is pulling up on, and as a result, he is taking a spill. And once he does, he always immediately looks up at me like, Dad, am I about to lose my mind, or are we ice cold chilling right now? Thoughts? And I have to just look at him and go, like really hiding, like, ooh, I'm like, instead I'm like, yeah, son, you're chilling. Or for those of you who don't have kids, perhaps you've been on a sports team and your team is down, it's halftime, and you're looking to your coach, what do we need to do? How do we need to act? How do we need to react? How do we gauge this situation? In the same way, my son will look to me after a spill or an athlete looks to a coach during halftime, so do we need to look to our Heavenly Father for perspective, for meaning, for purpose, and our pursuit of pleasure, wisdom, and our work-to-life ratio. God gives us the proper perspective. God gives us the meaning to the seemingly meaningless, as the meaning of our existence is to find ourselves in Him. Now, we're going to enter into a time of response, and there's a couple of things I'd like you to bring before the Lord in prayer, if you would. First one is this. What might I be idolizing before the Lord? 
as I did the thought experiment before, maybe there's something that came to mind that you think about often. And you're like, if I just had this thing, then I will be finally content. With this time, if you will, I want to encourage you to commit that thing to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be content in you. I want to choose you. And second, Lord, help me see your hand in my life. Let me see your hand in the things where the meaning isn't quite clear. I don't know why things are happening the way we are because we believe God is sovereign. As Paul famously said, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So what might I be idolizing over God? And Lord, help me see your hand through all things in my life. Will you bow your heads with me as we just take a few moments to pray through these things, and then I'll give us an invitation into response time. Jesus, may we see you as the main thing. May we truly see you as Lord over all. Our true source of joy, peace, hope, and contentment. May we not be waiting for the next thing to be content. May we choose it today in you. We thank you that your joy is for today. Your peace, your hope is for today. And we place no idols before you, Lord God. And Holy Spirit, we ask for discernment. We ask that you would show us the ways that you are moving in our lives, what you might be up to, Lord God. You don't let storms happen for nothing cause them, but you don't let them happen for nothing. In your sovereignty, you're able to build your children up, strengthen your children, giving us space for growing in Christ-likeness. So may we be attentive to you, Holy Spirit, and what you might be up to. May we have a listening ear. Thank you, God, that you bring meaning to the seemingly meaningless areas of our lives. May we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna go into a time of response. The worship team up here leading us in worship. I'm gonna encourage you all to a posture of surrender, and that can look like many things. One of them being singing along, singing these songs out to the Lord. And my encouragement is, having your heart follow what your body does. We raise our hands and worship as a bodily expression of what we want our heart to do. Surrender to the Lord. Hands open saying, Lord, I give you all of me. I'm not holding back, I give you my all. But this time you can also just continue the conversation with God. In what areas of my life do I have idols that are placed before you, Lord? What areas of my life am I waiting for something to happen to finally be content? Committing that to the Lord and choosing Him today. Another thing you could do is turn to the person that you came with and ask them, hey, I would like prayer. Let's be a people who build one another up, who are pointing each other to the Lord and praying. But whatever you choose to do in this time, let's do it in a heart of surrender. Let's do it in a posture of Jesus, move in my heart. I want to know you more. Will you stand with me? Take me back 
and a flame To nothing between us remains My life is an altar to you Breathe again On the embers that burn in my heart I love taking back to the start my life is an altar to you A new wind, a pure and willing spirit Take me back to where it all began
answer. In our lives, we pour out our praise to you. Oh, one more time. It's your bread. In our lives, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your bread. In our lives, so we. Asking Holy Spirit, bring about transformation in me. Holy Spirit, refine me more and more to the man or woman of God I am created to be. We know that he who began a good work will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Every day, we are in the process of becoming. Everything we do is an act of becoming. So may we choose obedience to you, Jesus, above all else. For you, our Lord pray this in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you brothers and sisters. Happy Sunday.